Welcome to this webinar by a Meston expert on how to gain value from artificial intelligence. And just to give you a sneak preview, we actually achieved 6,000% return on investment on an AI project. So there are huge benefits to be had from AI projects. And we will be telling you more about this in a short while. I am Lars Rinnen, I am the CEO of Amesta Nextbridge, and I will be your moderator for the next 60 minutes. As you probably have guessed, I am not Danish, I am Norwegian. But as a courtesy to you, I will be speaking English in this webinar, and so will my colleague Kjetil. But my other colleague Rune will be speaking the Queen's Danish. We want to keep this webinar short and fast-paced, so if you have any questions, please use the email address provided on the last slide, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Now, there are three parts to this webinar. The first part is a short in, uh, inspirational tour of various AI projects. The second part is a deep dive into a text analytics project. And the third part is some input on how to get you started on your first AI project. So enough with that, let's dive into the webinar. So who is Amesto Nextbridge? The company is probably the most experienced consultancy within data-driven insight in the Nordics. With 40 experts, almost half of them with a PhD, and with 16 years of average experience. I think this tells the story of a company with subject matter experts aiming to be the reference within data-driven insight. Enough with that. Let's go on with the inspirational AI projects. Let's talk about bees, whales, and football. This may sound a bit strange, but the common denominator is artificial intelligence. Let's dive in with bees first. So, you probably heard that bees are dying in large numbers, and that this is a problem also for us human beings, as bees pollinate 75% of all the food crop that we eat. So we teamed up with startup Bee Futures to explore if AI could be part of the solution in helping bees to survive. It seems that finding food within reasonable distance from the beehive is one of the largest causes of bee death. And it also turns out that bees try to help each other find food, and they do this by dancing. They communicate by dancing. And we have actually uh, decoded how bees communicate to each other. So what happens is that when a bee is out flying, foraging for food, she finds uh, some pollen, she flies back to the beehive, and then she wants to tell the rest of the beehive where she found food. And she does this by dancing the so-called bee waggle dance which is kind of a figure eight dance going in circles like this. And in the middle of the figure eight, there's a straight line. And this straight line points directly to the food source relative to the sun, because the bees always know where the sun is. And the distance of the straight line in the middle of the figure eight tells you the distance to the food source. With one centimeter of dancing, equaling about 750 meters in distance. So then you have direction and you have distance. And then you can translate this to a map showing uh, the beekeeper where all the bees have been finding food. So this way, the beekeeper can optimize the location of the beehive, beehive and prevent bee death. So this sounds pretty straightforward but I can tell you it was quite, quite hard, actually. So how do you get a computer to understand what a bee is? You know, even a small child can recognize a bee, you know, this yellow and black organism. 
But a co for a computer, it's just a collection of pixels. So we had to train the computer to understand that this collection of pixels is a B, whereas that collection of pixels is not a B. So that takes you know, uh, a large number of, of B uh, videos. But we did that with uh, using videos from within the beehive, where it's dark, it's crowded, there are 40,000 bees crawling on top of each other. But we still manage to distinguish what is a bee, who are the moving bees, and which of the bees are actually doing the figure eight dance, the bee waggle dance. And then we can translate that to, to an app. So going from very complex analysis over to a very simple solution, an app in the hand of the beekeeper, optimizing the location of the beehive, which is good for the bees, it's good for the beekeeper, but it's also good for us human beings, hence the pollination of all the food crops. So this project, which was actually a Nordic uh, sustainability hackathon, which we incidentally won with this case, also addresses eight of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we're really proud to use our AI knowledge in this AI for Good project. Now, from bees flying in the air to a small creature swimming in the ocean, the krill. So Archer Biomarine is a company harvesting krill in the Antarctic. They're the world leader in this. But they still want to be better and better all the time. They're really ambitious. So they came to us saying, can you actually help us find the krill? predict where we find krill on any, any given day using machine learning. And as in the bee case, we said that we don't know anything about krill. But if you have a lot of data, we can see if we can find some patterns in the data, and maybe we can predict where you find krill. So we started collecting data, a lot of different and strange data. We connected to NASA satellites. We looked at uh, salination levels, chlorophyll levels in the sea, ice levels. We even looked at moon phases because that also affects the diving patterns of the krill. And at some point, we even connected to two large blue whales swimming in the Antarctic because they were marked for research purposes and full of sensors. And let me just show you a short video to give you an uh, insight into why we connected to blue whales. So, so that's pretty amazing. You know, one of the largest creatures on Earth feeding on one of the smallest creatures on Earth. And of course, this creature, you know, the this length of three school buses, they eat about five tons of krill every day. So of course, the blue whale knows where to find krill. Unless, uh, w without that, it would die. It, it, it would go extinct. So connecting to these uh, blue whales uh, was a stroke of genius, they thought. At least that was until one of them just disappeared. The signal just disappeared. Uh, we still don't know if the sensors fell off, if it was killed or died or whatever happened. Uh, and the other one swam onto the coast of uh, South America uh, to Argentina, just uh, taking vacation for a couple of weeks. And of course, for us, the whales are a data source, and we can't have 
this kind of unreliable data sources. So we had to skip the blue whale, you know, the blue whale idea. But the next idea was this little thing, which is an autonomous buoy sailing around in the Antarctic, collecting a lot of data with a lot of sensors. So again, it's, it's about, you know, using your creativity to find solutions. So with all those different data sources, we started to see patterns in the data. And it ended up with, again, in an app, you know, in the hands of the captain of the ships. So based on really complex analysis, it turned out to be an app showing the captain where to find krill on Tuesday, where to find krill on Wednesday and on Thursday. Again, providing valuable insight and also value for the company utilizing this. Okay, let's jump on to football. Now, Denmark has always been a country of footballers. You have some of the best footballers in the world. And you have always beaten Norway in the national matches. So let's have a look at how AI can actually transform football. Let's have a look at this video. har världens mest populära sport fotboll kombinerar det med avancerad AI-teknologi. Kickerace är en mobil app som låter spelarna analysera deras egna skuggfärdigheter. De vill kunna se var hårt de skjuter, bollens kurve och precision. Plattformen ger dig möjlighet till att utveckla dig själv som spelare och träffa och konkurrera mot fotbollsspelare från hela världen. Amesto Data Scientists har doktorgrad i kvantitativa fag och det är vi som har utvecklat AI-motorn till Kickerace från Sports Computing. So again, this is a startup that we teamed, teamed up with uh, called Sports Computing, consisting of two guys only. Uh, and we've been helping them for a couple of years, developing this, uh, this solution. So it consists of augmented reality to detect the goalpost and the ball, the ball size and the distance to the, to the goal. It contains of artificial intelligence, connecting all the gamification elements and also physics model to, to predict uh, the tra trajectory of the ball, the curve of the ball, and also the speed of the ball. So this two-man company is now just about ready to launch their first product called Kicker Ace, and they're going global. Of course, this is the way the world has gotten to. A two-man company going global. I think that's fantastic and it's so satisfying to be able to help those kind of ambitious startups. So using AI, you can actually transform the way we train, compete and have fun with, with football. Again, it looks pretty simple, but it's quite complex. Like I said, we spent almost two years uh, developing this, this solution and with some of the best uh, physics PhDs in the world actually. As a matter of fact, two of the people who have been on this team uh, during those two years have actually been also been on Nobel Prize winning physics projects. One of them helped discover the Higgs boson in 2012 and the other one helped uh, discover graphene. So some of the best uh, physics PhDs in, in the country. Uh, I think it's a fantastic solution and if you have any connection with, with football or a football association, maybe you're a coach of your, your daughter's team or anything, please do get in contact with us to, uh, to gain some more insight on this uh, incredible solution. Now we talked about bees, whales and football which is you know kind of the outliers in, in terms of AI projects. We, we don't do just strange projects. We also do some pretty ordinary projects, but with a lot of value within them. This is a project we did for the Norwegian Postal Service. Uh, they get, you know, 
thousands of thousands of parcels coming into the distribution centrals every day. And they have 16 distribution centrals, so there's a lot of parcels, a lot of data. And of course they need to know how many parcels come into the distribution central at any given day and at any given time of the day. So of course they had some algorithms to, uh, to predict this, but they wanted to see if using you know, state-of-the-art machine learning could improve their algorithms. Uh, after only three months in this project, we had improved those models quite substantially, providing the Norwegian Postal Service the ability to save 60 million Norwegian kroner annually. So that computes into a 6,000% return on investment, which is pretty amazing. Of course, that gets attention also within the company. And then you get you know, more attention around AI using new technology. You get more funding, you get more management backing. Everything kind of just opens up. So again, we also do a lot of these more, uh, you know, uh, industry-like projects, but with great value. So I hope this uh, short introduction uh, has given you some inspiration as to all the different types of projects that AI actually might provide value. Seeing using bees as, as sensors, using whales as sensors, looking at football uh, and detecting the football with just your mobile camera but also the more ordinary projects, you know, within marketing, within logistics, within finance, within sales, within all the different areas of your business. So for us, everything, every data is a source of insight and we can analyze any kind of data to provide insight and to provide value. So if we can do this for bees, whales and football, just think of what we can do for you. And now I want to hand over the table to my good colleague Rune in uh, Copenhagen to look into a text analytics project that we did for the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent. Rune, the stage is yours. I dag vil jeg fortælle, hvordan vi hjælper det internationale Røde Kors med at læse tusindvis af rapporter helt automatisk. Det internationale Røde Kors leverer noget hjælp til verdensbrændspunkter. Det gør det blandt andet på baggrund af en lang række rapporter, som indsendes ude fra feltet. Der er mere end 10.000 lokale kontorer i 192 medlemsland. Hvert år indsendes mere end 2.000 rapporter, som er ustruktureret fritekst. Helt klassiske rapporter, skrevet på en række sprog, typisk hovedsprog for dem. Projektet her startede som et COVID-19-projekt, men i dag rettede meget mere generelt mod alle de katastrofer, hvor Røde Kors yder bistand. Rapporterne indsættes løbende til Genève, hvor et team sidder og gennemlæser og mere eller mindre manuelt kategoriserer indhold. På baggrund af rapporterne bliver der skrevet et resume af de forskellige katastrofer. Det er tydeligvis en tung proces og meget tidskrævende. Her er det vigtigt, at det bliver gjort på den rigtige tid, inden det er for sent. Jeg starter med at introducere mig selv. Mit navn er Rune Jul. Jeg arbejder med statistisk modellering og machine learning i en række felter som hjerteforskning, optimal opvarmning af boliger, og kunstige fuglspøtkirtler og meget andet. Jeg brænder for at skabe værdi ud fra data. Det internationale Røde Kors har selvfølgelig begrænsede ressourcer. De er nødt til at prioritere ressourcerne, så det er for de rigtige katastrofer for den nødhjælp, de har behov for på det rigtige tidspunkt. Når en katastrofe begynder, forsøger man at prøve at forudse omfanget og behovet for nødhjælp. Som mange andre organisationer og virksomheder, så medfører det også, at der bliver opsamlet enorme mængder data. Røde Kors har en dataplatform, som de kalder DIP, hvor man opsamler alle det her data. Når data så er blevet opsamlet, så har man så et analyseværktøj og en platform, som man kalder Go. 
Her der kan vi se et, ligesom et eksempel på et output derfra, hvor vi kigger på en folkevandring i Sydamerika. Her der kan vi se, hvordan det er blevet kategoriseret øh, for en type katastrof, der er og, og en, en række forskellige øh, ting, som er interessant ligesom at vide omkring en, en katastrofe. Det er de her ting, som kommer på baggrund af blandt andet den forfordring. Og det er her, hvor vi Nextbridge kan komme ind og ligesom få hjælp dem med at gøre det her på en nemmere og mere automatisk måde. Der er en masse brandpunkter rundt omkring i verden, som vi ser her, så, så der, hvor de er engageret lige nu, og man kan se, hvad ligesom deres behov er. Og hvis vi tager et kig på et af de feltrapporter, som kommer derude fra, så kunne det se sådan her ud. Det er en rapport, som så er blevet gennemlæst, og der er, de har allerede noget assisteret hjælp til ligesom at tagge de her ting. Men vi kan se, hvordan den skal kategoriseres ned igennem, som her, som, som mad, jordbrug og logistik. Og hvis vi tænker på, at der kommer mere end 2.000 af de her rapporter hver eneste år, så er der bare rigtig meget arbejde. Det, som vi bidrager med, det er jo så sprogmodeller, der kan forstå det. Vi har testet en lang række sprogmodeller. Der er rigtig meget vælgevalg ude i litteraturen. Og hvis man kigger til de rigtig store virksomheder, som har meget tekst, altså for eksempel Facebook og Google, så er de med til at, ligesom at udvikle nogle meget store og komplicerede sprogmodeller og teste på de kæmpe mængder data og tekst, de har. Den type modeller gør så, at de har en rigtig god sprogforståelse, generelt sprogforståelse, og det er altså noget, vi kan drage nytte af til vores specifikke data her. I vores proof of concept, som vi lavede til Rød Kors, der har vi ikke fået de bedste resultater med Googles BERT-model. BERT står for Bidirectional Encoder Representation for Transformers. Det er ikke super vigtigt, og vi kommer ikke til at gå, gå videre ind i lige præcis, hvordan modellen fungerer. Det der på pointen med de her sprogmodeller er, at de giver en rigtig god sprogforståelse, eller generelt sprogforståelse. Det betyder for eksempel, at de kan forstå, at ting så er et ord som oversvømmelse og, og for eksempel meget vand, jamen det kan betyde det samme. Det er altså ikke bare et, opslag, et opslagsværk på, på ligesom nogle keyword, men sprogforståelse, vi går efter. Som jeg sagde, så er de store firmaer øh, i gang med det her slås ligesom om det. Det her det er det næste rumkabløb, hvor der er rigtig stor og rivende udvikling på sprogmodeller. Helt frem i løbet lige nu, jamen, der har vi OpenAI og deres GPT-3-model. Modsat de andre modeller, jeg nævnte før, jamen, så er GPT-3-modellen ikke en, man bare kan blive til at bruge. Der er blevet lagt nogle begrænsninger på, og det kræver, at man bliver godkendt til at få lov til at bruge den her. Vi, Amazon Express, har fået lov til at bruge GPT-3 til netop på et kortes projekt. GPT-3 hæver helt generelt niveauet for sprogforståelsen. Her der får vi en, 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 en meget bedre mulighed for at få svar på de spørgsmål, vi stiller på baggrund af f.eks. en feltrapport. GPT-3 er dog ikke heldigvis, og desværre måske en, ikke en 100% løsning, hvor vi bare kan gøre en fritekstrapport af til den, og så stille den og forvente, at vi ligesom kommer med nogle store konklusioner på baggrund af det. Der er stadigvæk begrænsninger, og der er stadigvæk behov. Der er både tekniske begrænsninger, som man er nødt til at forholde sig til med den her type model. Det kræver forarbejde, og det kræver efterbehandling af både tekstmaterialet og de resultater, man får ud fra modellet. Vi arbejder i forbindelse med det her kortprojekt på at indarbejde GPC-3 i vores næste fase af projektet. Det lyder jo alle sammen super godt med automatisk læsning og tagging af en rapport, men hvor godt virker det faktisk. Kigger herover i siden, så kan vi se, hvordan udviklingen har været gennem tid. Der er ikke nogen tvivl om, at det er blevet bedre. Men vi klarer sig ikke lige så godt som et helt frisk menneske, som har sovet rigtig godt, fået en god kop kaffe og bare helt topmotiveret for at, for at læse og kategorisere en rapport. Det man bare typisk ser, også i Røde Kors, 
mekanismen, det er, at bots performance, den har det med at dale relativt hurtigt øh, over tid. Måske ikke det mest interessante at sidde og læse det her, og sådan ligesom holde et, et konsekvent niveau over tid. Og derfor så falder det på. Modellerne derimod, jamen, de kan gøre det dels hurtigt, læse en rapport væsentligt hurtigere, end mennesker kan gøre, og de kan performe rimelig konsistent. Og sammenlignet med et, den, den, den knap så motiverede medarbejder, jamen, så er vi ved at være, så er vi på niveau eller faktisk klarer lidt bedre, end, end, end hvad man ser, for eksempel hos Røde Kors. Hvor det modellerne er jo, som sagt, at de kører hele tiden, men også, at de ligesom kan blive bedre og bedre med tiden. Man kan ligesom øh, føde det her øh, data tilbage ind i modellen, når, når det kommer videre ned i, i ens analysepipeline, og man måske finder nogle fejl i den måde, der bliver kategoriseret på. Og det kommer så med tilbage til, så man som model bliver klogere på, jamen, hvordan skulle det her faktisk have været kategoriseret. Det vi hjælper Røde Kors med, det vi leverer til Røde Kors, jamen, det er de her tre ting. Vi starter med engineering, det er både data engineering, men også systemopsætning. Her der kører vi i Microsoft Asia Cloud, og hvor vi får trukket data ind til at kunne behandle det. Så har vi modelleringen, det er her, hvor vi bruger de her forskellige sprogmodeller, og slutligt har vi integration. Vi har leveret en, her i prototypen har vi leveret en, en dashboard til, til Røde Kors, hvor de har mulighed for at se, hvordan modellen egentlig klarer sig, og de har kunnet sidde og følge med i, hvordan den, den performer på forskellige typer fritek, som de har. Vi er nu nået til integrationen i det her projekt, og integrationen det er, hvor vi skal integrere i de her platforme, som de har, de og gå. Det vi Grundlæggende set leverer, at API som skaber en grænseflade mellem det produkt, som vi leverer, og deres eksisterende platform. Vi kan altså både levere, øh, levere og hoste produktet her, altså vores API kan vi have hos os, eller lægge det hos dem, eller på hvilken som helst byprovider, det er sådan set fuldstændig irrelevant. Vi kan, vi kan lægge det hvor som helst. Vi er meget stolte af det her projekt. Det er, et, det, det, det er dejligt at være på et projekt, hvor man virkelig kan mærke, at det, det kan bruges med at gøre en forskel. Det her er også et projekt, som så derved bliver støttet fra Røde Kors selv, men også fra den norske innovationsfond. Og Microsoft har givet os en lang række ressourcer på deres Asia Cloud platform, hvor vi har kunnet køre og træne de her tunge sprogmodeller. Hvis vi kigger på, hvordan man ellers kunne forestille sig at bruge sprogmodeller, så er der en række forskellige ting, man kan komme i tanke om. Vi har et projekt lige nu, hvor vi er i gang med at fjerne personfølelser og information fra, øh, fra, fra tekst. Det er et projekt, som vi kører i samarbejde med, med vores partnere. Og det er et spørgsmål om, at nogle gange er der noget tekst, hvor der er for, at du kan være GDPR compliant, så er du nødt til at kunne fjerne nogle af de her personhenførbare data. Og hvis man kan gøre det på en automatisk måde, det er bare øh, nemt. Det er et eksempel, hvor man kan bruge det. Man kan også forestille sig fordeling af e-mails. Hvis man nu har en kundeservice-funktion, hvor man har én indgående inbox, så øh, man har man 10 forskellige teams, for eksempel, der skal håndtere forskellige, øh, forskellige områder. Men så man kan godt på en automatisk måde kunne fordele de her indkommende e-mails ud til de forskellige ting. Der kan man også bruge sprogmodeller. Vi kan også forestille os ting som overvågning af medier, presse, sociale medier, hvor man ikke bare vil lave simpel keyword opslag på, på tekst som på, på f.eks. Twitter og Facebook, men simpelthen prøve at forstå, hvad er det egentlig, der bliver sagt, hvad er intentionen med det, der bliver skrevet, og hvad er, er, det, var de, hvad er, det, er det er det en glad eller en sur tekst, der bliver skrevet. Og til sidst så også noget som spørgeskemaundersøgelser, medarbejdersundersøgelser. Ting som der, hvor det også igen kan, hvor det ikke bare nødvendigvis er et multiple choice, men, men hvor der er et fritekst, man kan prøve at skabe forståelse ud fra. Det er altså ting, hvor man kan bruge sprogmodeller. Og det var, hvad jeg havde været at sige om 
vores kortsprojekt med automatisk læsning af tusindvis af rapporter. Jeg håber, I fik noget af det. Thank you very much, Rune, for that inspirational presentation. I think that text analytics offers a lot of use cases, and maybe you can think of a use case in your company. Now, I'm turning the, the word over to uh, my colleague Kjetil. Kjetil is heading up the AI lab at the Messon Bridge, and he is also an AI advisor, having guided a numerous companies into their first AI projects, ensuring that they get good value from their initiatives. Kjetil, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lars. Um, so, um, how do you get started with AI? Well, it is actually easier than you think. Um, and uh, essentially, there are three things you need. It's very simple. And if you don't have time to listen to all what I'm saying, I think what you hear now is the most important takeaway. And that is, you need domain knowledge. You need to know about your business, what you're doing, and where the problems are and where the opportunities are. Then you need data, and only you have data about you and your business. That's the secret uh, ingredients. And then you need data science. You need data scientists, and that could be us. Now, when I learned data science some years ago, I thought, this is wonderful. This is fantastic. Now I want to make something really smart. And I talked to my friends about this, and they asked me, so if you have these good tools, if you know data science, if you're so smart, how come you're not rich? <laughs> and the answer is, I didn't have domain knowledge, and I didn't have data. You have that. You have a very good starting point in order to start with data science. Well, but how mature are you really using data? And where do you want to get? Do you want to get to the upper right corner and use artificial intelligence? I'm sure you have some raw data. You have some data somewhere. Uh, but when you talk about AI, it's like, what the heck is that? You might have some standard reports, some business intelligence systems that tell you about what happened last year compared to this year, and so on. And you might have some ad hoc reporting. You might even have started the journey of uh, being more analytical. The next step is being predictive. That is to have a prediction of what is going to happen based on what happened historically. Most companies are at level two or three. And maybe they've moved into the, the fourth uh, defined level of, of using data in a good way. But if you want to get to the artificial stage of using data, it's really a journey. And this journey, you need to do yourself. You need to learn. You need to learn by first crawling, then standing, and then running. So why now? Well, first of all, there's more data. And there's more data from everywhere. First of all, there's more data within your company. There's more data about your clients, about your customers, about your processes. You might have sensors. You might have uh, web pages where your visitors come in and, and look at you and your products. You might have cell phones amongst your clients that gather in information. You might have um, knowledge uh, within social media. Maybe you have beacons where, which can place people um, in a ge geographical area. That's wonderful. You have more data. You have more sources of information. The good thing is, lately, this has been more interconnected, meaning that you not only know if somebody bought a, a product from you, but you also know who they are, what they did, what made, made them buy it. And if they bought this online, you, you know a lot more than you used to know uh, previously. 
Now, having the data and having it better connected is good, but if you can do some more intelligent decisions around this, using modern techniques and software and hardware, you are getting there. So this is, this is why uh, it's a um, good time now to, to start using data better and get towards AI. Now, the computing power is doubling every two years. And right now, we are on a path where we, around 20, 29, 2030, will have computers that are as smart as a human being. That's scary. That's scary. It's not that scary, really, because they are specialized. They're hi highly specialized. They can drive cars without you touching the, the, the uh, steering wheel. They can take decisions without you having to doubt them. They are getting smart within specific areas. Now, around 2060, the computers of this world might be as smart as a human being as such. They might be able to do uh, things by themselves, of course, within limits. So the, the, the opportunities are really getting there every year, and they double and they triple, and they are really um, exciting. Now, what is the problem? The problem is <laughs> you, you might have too much information. It is high volume, a variety of different sources of information that you might not be able to understand or get um, read or have insight into, or even store. If you want to store them, it, can't, it can be very uh, difficult or costly. And the speed of information that's coming in is increasing. You have a gap between what you're able to digest, understand, and what you have of data. Seems impossible. No, <laughs> it's never been easier, actually. It's been easier because the hardware is getting better. So you know, you know the story about the cell phone that is more advanced than, than uh, the, the supercomputers that had the Apollo landing on the moon? You know that. You also know that, that uh, um, your cell phone is getting increasingly uh, more advanced and it's getting cheaper. So the hardware is getting better, it's getting less expensive, and it's performing better. In addition to that, the software is getting better. It's, uh, it has more advanced analysis, it's more self-driven, it's easier to use, and it's designed in a better way. The software itself and the solutions are designed in a way that even you can use it. And, and some of the programming languages within AI are not languages. They are just icons you can drag and drop. And, and you can create uh, streams of analysis yourself without knowing the deep inners of, of AI. It has never been easier. So what stops you? Well, <laughs> I, I would say, do you have a strategy? Do you know what you want to do and, and why you want to do it? And I'm sure most of, of, of the companies, if not all, have a strategy. They have a strategy for what to sell, whom to market it to, what type of products, how to get the money in and out of the company and, and, and get a, a healthy profit. They have all this. And it starts with, with a vision and mission you have strategies, you have activities. I mean, that's the way the modern business is run nowadays. But do you have a data strategy? Very many companies don't have a data strategy. And you need to actually start there. You need to start with, what do I want to do and why? And how does this, this connect to the, the reason why to, to um, the reason why a company exists. So what do you actually need? Well, first of all, yes, you need a strategy and you need some governance. You need some controlling mechanisms around how to get to the strategy or how to get to your goals. And it needs, it needs to be tied up to, to why the company exists. You can make the most wonderful 
wonderful AI projects. But if they don't really give a benefit to the company, they are dead in the water. Of course, you need an analytical talent. We talked about that. You need tools, which are getting less expensive. You can even get them now online, in the cloud. You don't have to pay for them. You pay for them when you use them. So that's not a matter of, of, uh, of uh, investing uh, 100,000 kroner or $100,000 in order to get started. You can just start. You need architecture. You need uh, uh, some flow of the data. You need a pipeline of data. And you need to have data, and you need somewhere to put the data into. So either it's in your environment or in some kind of cloud environment. If you don't know how to do this, we can for sure help you with actually every single step in this stack. Not a problem. So, but <laughs> if you really want to condense it down to five factors to be successful within, within AI, I would say get started. Get started now. And gain experience. It doesn't have to be big. It's the, the crawling before the creeping <laughs> and before the running. It's actually learning how things work. Get started. Then you need to ensure spon sponsorship. By that, I mean you need to have a mandate. You need to have um, somebody telling you, do this because it ties up with what we want to do in the, for the future within AI. That's a very good start. Now, you might not have all the resources you need. So, and you might not have the experience, if you haven't started yet at least. So get help. Get help from somebody who has been doing this before, who can tell you how to do this, who, who can avoid the errors that you would do if you, wouldn't, if you didn't get help. Use the right tools. It's not always easy to know what tools to use. And if you listen to the, to the manufacturers, they might um, lure you into buying things you don't need. So use the right tools. And, and what are the right tools? Depends on what you're trying to solve. We can help you with that as well, of course. And then, most importantly, or important as well, <laughs> make a success story. Make sure that you create something that is used within the company, that is of value, that has a good return of investment, and that inspires to starting with new AI projects. So <clears throat> the way we do this is quite simple, actually. It's through a journey. And this journey is a journey where we interact with you. And most innovation projects are successful when there's a cooperation between a client and a supplier like us. And it starts really with um, awareness workshops. And you, you might say that this webinar is awareness uh, workshop, so, so to say. It's uh, what is possible with AI get inspired, understand the principles, and then the next step is a workshop around business cases. And that is to establish where do we think we could start with AI, what type of benefits would that be, and how can we do that. And from there, we start making a proof of concept. We test it. We see if it, do, it does give value. We see if we have the data we need. We see if we can uh, make a pilot of um, a solution that we could then implement in the future. And if it, it works, if it makes sense, we implement it. If it doesn't work, we've learned a lot. And we can go on to next phase or next idea. So what I'd like to do is ac actually invite you to start a small workshop of, say, one, two hours. And, and what we do then, then is we look at what business cases do you think you have? What type of use cases, what type of problems are you trying to solve, and how do you think you can solve them using data? Then we start digging into the data. We see, what type of data is this? What type of quality is it? How much do we have? Is it enough data? Is it the right, correct type of data? Does the data have the ability to give us the solution to the, to the problem or to the, to the thing we're trying to solve? And then we look at, does it make sense? Does it give a return of investment? And as Lars told you, 
Many projects have thousands of percent of uh, return of investment because they really make sense. And when we have a workshop like this, when we've found out what kind of type of business case do you want to work with, what type of data do we have, and does it make sense? Then we, s we start with who can be the sponsor of this, who is the, the, the receiver of what we do, who is cheering on us, who wants to make this a success, and, and we make sure that we latch on to them. We talk about, also in this workshop, we talk about how we can make this into a real world system. How can we scale up? And from there, when we have that in place, we can make a plan, a time estimate, a cost estimate of what it takes in the different steps to get to a solution. So that's, that's how you start with AI. Now, the question is, when do you start? And when do you actually start is a, a matter of where you stand. And it's a matter of if you want to be disrupted or not. So <laughs> are you dis disruption ready? Meaning, are you able to disrupt yourself? According to a, a research, a report done, done by IMD and Cisco, um, where they interviewed a thousand companies, and they asked them, Are you, have you started with AI? 25% of these companies said, yes, we have started. That means that um, they have a statistical chance of surviving and not being disrupted. <laughs> the, the, the bad thing is they have less than a 10% um, chance of surviving in the long term, even starting with AI. Now, the next segment is those who said that we are starting soon. A and that's good if you say we're going to start soon. But <laughs> you're in a hurry because you're already behind your competition. You're behind 25% of those who started, and you're 50, almost 50% behind those who are planning to start and who have started. Now, if you are in the segment of, of the 43% of these companies that hasn't even started with AI, I just wish you good luck. Because if you haven't started, the chance of surviving in the long term is diminishing, diminishing a lot. So start now is the message. As I promised you, <laughs> the conclusion is actually these three things. You need domain knowledge. You need your knowledge about your business. You need data. You need your data about your, about your business. And you need data science. And we can help you there. So, insight through data. It's really easy if you just start and start now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kjetil, for those good advices coming from an experienced advisor who has guided numerous companies on their first and second and third journey into the wonderful world of artificial intelligence. That's all from us at MX to Nextbridge. You have heard uh, about the vast arrangement of different AI types and different AI use cases from bees, whales and football. You've seen uh, the immense use cases of text analytics and how that saves a lot of work for the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent. And lastly, you got some really good advice on how to get started. And I think that the main message is it's easier than you think, but you probably need some experienced advisors to guide you on your first AI journey. So please do not hesitate to take contact with us. We would love to guide you into 6,000% return on investment or who knows, even, even more. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to use the email address which will be provided on the, the last slide of the webinar. Feel free to contact us at the Mesonext Bridge and have a good day. Thank you.